Um, so we're going to go to the next uh, section now, um, and right after that, we're going to have a panel discussion. We're trying to squeeze time so we can have uh, everyone a chance to, to talk. Uh, so we're going to call Kirana Andile, uh, who is CEO of Finlight. Uh, he's going to talk about psychology of saving, how behavioral economics can help your stock, your stock fail save more. So welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, 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 hello. Is the mic on? <clears throat> is the sound is the sound on? Is it on? Yes. Okay, I'm the only one who doesn't hear it. <laughs> Very funny. Okay. Um hello everyone. My name is Andy Lefulane. I'm from a company called Finlight Financial Education. Um, and uh, I've been invited here to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is financial literacy. Um, give a master class, especially to uh, to Stockfells. Uh, I've been involved with Stockfells for quite a number of years. Um, and right in front of me is a, a lady who, you know, just embraced me all the way from corporate, very naive, uh, from investment banking. Um, Mambusi Skenja, and uh, we call her the goddess of uh, Stockfells. Can we give her a round of applause? Yes, uh, so I've been involved with Stockfells ever since. So I'm going to talk about uh, a, a topic that is, uh, yeah, this is a bit of my, of my background. I do a lot of uh, innovation, build uh, tech solutions and uh, other gamified uh, solutions for financial literacy, which I'll share uh, a bit later. So, um, so what is behavioral finance? I think I'd, I'd like to have an engaging, because this is supposed to not be a workshop, but a master class, right? And not that I'm a master, but yeah, probably I'm getting there. Um, so I want this to be engaging. I'd like you to tell me what do you believe is behavioral finance? There's, there's people, I know there's a gentleman here who is a stockbroker, so he definitely knows what behavioral finance, because it's a conversation that we have in the investment world, but not very common, you know, on your day-to-day -day savings, especially around stock fills, right? Uh, I mean, the concepts uh, look sophisticated, but as I share them, you'll see that they are very, very common. It's just about awareness, right? So anyone who volunteers, tell me what do you think behavioral finance is, behavioral finances? And not a banker, please. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, ma'am. A mic, a, a mic, please. Those things, those little petty things that can that can um, influence your financial behavior. Mm, mm, perfect. Please give her a, a round of applause. She nailed it. Just just from the the key words, it's it's how do we behave around money? It's financial psychology basically, and it sounds complicated, but financial psychology is. Uh, about being aware of why we make certain financial decisions. So, I mean, research says about 80% of our decisions are actually made from emotions. Uh, anyone agree? Anyone agree? I, I read a couple of years ago that um, uh, adults actually suffer from peer pressure more than teenagers. <laughs> you know, um, whenever there's a reunion you know, you were students at vets or wherever the case may be, we start reflecting, what do I have? What do I have to tell? What's my story? Or when you meet someone for the first time, I'm like, wow, what are you doing? You know, what are you into? It's an emotional question, you know, and it's, a, it's around behavioral finance and how you respond. You'll either respond, you know, from objectivity or you'll respond from emotions because you want to protect your ego. Am I right? Yes, you will try and exaggerate certain things because you want to look important, you want to feel important. And it's part of our nature. 
So we go around with this protection and all the financial uh, decisions that we make are actually around uh, uh, our emotions. So behavioral finance is about understanding that. So when you reference this back to stock fills, there's many kind of stock fills. Uh, there's funeral stock fills, uh, they call them burials, there's grocery stock fills. Uh, who can tell me which one is the most popular? Which one, which one uh, uh, is uh, the most popular? Stock fail. What kind of stock fail, you know, ranks above the rest? <laughs> okay, wow. That was a moment for you. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't miss it. Probably funeral and groceries, right? So these two, definitely. And do you know that the background, it is because of the culture and where people are from. So our geography uh, and you'll see, we'll talk about biases, right? Our geography, where we come from, influences our spending patterns. So, you know, in the rural areas, uh, you know, it's survival. In township, it's survival. So that's why you see a lot of grocery stock fills. That's why you see a lot of funeral stock fills, right? Because of survival. And people don't want to be embarrassed. That's what is driving the culture around, you know, funeral. And I, I know, I mean, insurance companies take advantage of the fact that, you know, people are vulnerable around death. You know, in black communities, when someone has passed away, they must be buried with respect. So, you know, uh, some funerals, and I mean, you'll see the psychology of it, for some funeral societies, you know, they, I mean, some young people will complaining that, uh, you know, I don't sleep in a good place. I sleep in a mattress, but I know that a lot has been invested toward my death. You know, so that's the psychology. But when you understand the culture and you understand the environment that people come from, then we stop judging people. Right. And I've worked with uh, a lot of corporate uh, companies and it sounds like an easy question to say, why don't you take a bit of that money and, and put it here? Why don't you, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? But people are actually saving up for groceries because for them, food is wealth an abundance of food is wealth. If I can take care of my family, that means I have dignity, you know, amongst the community that I am. So it's about understanding behavior and the environment that influences that behavior. You know, so that's why I have these uh, images there. And I mean, uh, we talk, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know my, my, my madame from Sarkisis, when uh, there's a lot of stock fills that we can um, talk about. You know, we, 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 I mean, uh, my lady spoke about franchise stock fills, right? It's a journey. Most of the money is still, I remember the banks used to call stock fill money gray money. Right. It used to be gray money because most of the money is just sitting and doing nothing. And it's loyal money again. I mean, uh, you know, Mambusi also shared some insights that were mind blowing about uh, cash and carries that are hoarding stock fill money. Right. Because people want to say you can't touch that money. That money comes religiously each and every month and you can't touch it. And I mean, the cash and carry or the supermarket grows their business. Imagine you always have cash. You know that business is cash flow. So imagine that your business always has cash flow throughout the year and you're going to you know, release this cash. You're not going to release cash. You're going to release it in the form of products, in, in form of, of grocery and so forth. So it's at, uh, about understanding those psychologies and how they influence stock flows that you can be able to even advise because if you don't understand people and where they come from, we cannot even stand in a position to say we actually advise you uh, on where to put your money. Okay. So um, I've already spoken about how emotions are actually affecting our financial decisions. So there's one of the biases is called heading, right? Heading. I mean, it's, you know, it's just obvious. I said the, the names... Uh, the words actually give it away. So heading, you'll see it in the cryptocurrency market, right? Heading is when people just follow the trend for the sake of the trend, without following, without understanding what actually pushes the trend, right? And these are the, uh, um, uh, you know, trends that actually create a bubble and crashes, right? Because there's no substance that is actually pushing the behavior. There's no asset that is backing up on why this thing actually needs to uh, create a, a, a bubble. Check out on Netflix. I can't remember. There's a documentary there, but it talks about uh, someone who started a, uh, a, a, some kind of cryptocurrency, and it was just pushed by social media to actually go. I mean, Dogecoin is one of the examples as well. Uh, you know, so, and I know that there's you know, uh, um, uh, crypto enthusiasts 
But what I'm saying is when you get into that space and, you know, you should know and understand if you're getting into Forex, if you're getting into property, I mean, a lot is being said about property. You should at least have an idea on what pushes property, what makes the capital to grow. What makes, what brings in the income? How do you manage the risk of tenants and so forth? You know, if an economy is not growing and people are not renting, would your property still grow? If they say it's a safe investment, do, you, do they tell you that, you know, property can be stagnant for quite a while? You know, so those are the dynamics that you shouldn't be just follow as a sheep that just follows because, you know, uh, uh, others are going this direction. So that's, that's called heading. And then there's uh, one that's called loss aversion. And, you know, among Stockfells, there'll be people that say, uh, you know, and I've worked with Stockfells, I've, I've been starting my business, uh, we started as a Stockfell, and we were getting into a property Stockfell. And some of our, our the people, the members that we are starting, uh, starting with, we were, which were my varsity friends, uh, said, you know, what if the tenants don't pay? Where is the money going to come from? I'm like, you're a business person and you're an investor. Where do you think the money is going to come from? It's going to come from you. You know, you should be able to stomach the losses as much as you want the highs. Am I right? So the loss aversion almost creates a trauma. So many times that people have such a loss aversion that they don't see opportunities. So if they hear a story of someone has lost money around properties, then it's a loss aversion that I won't touch properties as, uh, at all. I'd rather put my money in a bank. I know it's safe. But you know that, uh, you know, your money is actually be key, being killed by inflation. So that's... That's a loss aversion for some people. I'm trying to rush because I, I, I've seen that, um, you know, uh, time is not on our side. <laughs> uh, I, I hope I'm not talking too fast. Um, and then there's overconfidence. And if you can see, I like this image because, you know, <laughs> you know uh, the ego is saying we are winning. You know, uh, but in the actual fact, the person is actually blind. Uh, Ten minutes. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Um, so, so. There, there's people that are overconfident, uh, you know, and you should be aware of those. There's be people in your stock field that are overconfident about something without giving you the backing of data. The most important thing that we ignore as stock field, as especially um, individual investors as well. Uh, my wife didn't trust me about, although I have a, <laughs> I have a background, I mean, I, I, I spend time in, in corporate doing investment banking. Uh, including being an investment analyst, my wife still, didn't, still couldn't trust me with the, with the money of the family. She still wanted it to go into an insurance company because that's how she learned. And it took a lot of years. It's only now, I think we were making some withdrawals because we wanted to make, uh, um, you know, wanted to invest in some property in the rural area. And then I showed it an 82%. And I showed, you know, the 82% and how did we get to 82%? And we've survived all these, you know, bubbles. And I had invested in cryptocurrency, but how did I invest in cryptocurrency? A lot of money just sits idle, just me doing the analytics, just me doing data and trying to find out where the opportunities are and then picking those and then just let it. I'm not a day trader. You know, I know there's day traders here. But I just let it. Once I've chosen a stock, I allow it to go because I'm not overconfident and it's not my full-time job. Trading is a profession, right? People need to go to school, need to be informed. And people who sell trading softwares and all these things and workshops that cost 20,000 rands, they'll tell you you'll be rich quickly. And that's where um, uh, overconfidence comes from and people, and I've seen people losing a lot of money because of that. Okay. And then, uh, and then there's confirmation bias. So confirmation bias, you know, it's someone who, who is there, you know, to just confirm. Even if they're looking for data, they're looking for data that confirms what they've already preconceived. So that's a confirmation bias. I know we need to get it when you're in a group. Group dynamics are there. I mean, stock fails are actually hard to, I've had a lot of companies, and they like, get us into stock fails, get us into stuff. I'm like, you just need to know that the sales cycle is very long because there's those group dynamics. There's someone who's just adamant that we need to invest in property or someone in stocks. Why? Because they have a confirmation bias. They don't want to look at the data, how focus are looking for, are looking uh, like. They just want to, uh, you know, confirm the biases that they already have. So those are the dynamics that uh, you will look at uh, when, you, when you're doing your stock fail conversations. And then there's a present bias. And I've put uh, three I could have put property here, but, you know, <laughs> I've chosen taxi, right? So there's present bias. Present is immediate gratification, right? So there's people 
stockfellers that want to buy something immediately. When there's money, why are we not using this money? This money is, I've sat in those stockfellers. I'm doing coaching. I've done family stockfellers. And there's elders, you know, when you understand African dynamics, elders are respected, but sometimes they don't have the knowledge, right? So uh, people are saying that just money is sitting there. We could be doing this and that and that. They just want to spend money, okay? So... Um, that's confirmation bias. I worked with a stock fell of taxi drivers in North, in MTN Taxi Rank, right? Some people were confirming that they've bought taxis. They were drivers. They've bought taxis because they could delay the gratification and look at the five-year term, put money away, and the taxi drivers have a lot of cash flow. That's another thing that people don't know, right? Um, and, then, and they were able to buy that. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, I think I'm closing up. So I've created, uh, so this is just an example of how these biases can actually affect a stock fell. Uh, you know, the Umoja has a short term, it's contributing the same amount, but it's putting money in the bank, you know, and it's sitting on cash and it's accumulating about 3% uh, if they are lucky. Um, and then the total amount comes to about 13,000. Uh, 38,000. There's another one that, you know, a money that lends about diversification and investing in property, some of it in equity, some of it somewhere else. They have got their financial literacy. They understand the dynamics of investing. And, uh, you know, they could be gaining uh, 12%. And over that five years, uh, the money has actually become 74,000. The difference is about 35,000. It's not as simple as I say. But what I'm saying is all those biases could cost the stock fell real wealth over time, basically. That's the message that I'm, that I'm actually uh, saying. I know that there'll uh, be time for any questions. So yeah, I'm, as I'm wrapping up, uh, I spend most of my time now educating or rather um, grooming new wealth managers, especially for black communities that understand uh, black communities. So we are uh, accredited with the insurance CETA. We do consumer education, employee financial wellness and the likes. Uh, we do a lot of innovative things. One of the things that we do, uh, we produce this uh, podcast uh, by Palisa Lingolo, whom I know was a speaker yesterday. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's doing well. Spotify is in the top 20% in the business sector. Please follow uh, the podcast. Uh, we got a publishing deal with the podcast and uh, the, po the publishing deal is taking us to 250 local radio stations in South Africa. Um, so, which, you know, taking the education to uh, where it's needed most. Uh, we've developed this board game as well. Seeing the barriers around financial education, we developed this board game, which we launched, I think, about two weeks ago, uh, which is around soccer. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, seeing how, how powerful soccer is, and it's around emotions, right? You know, <laughs> people will kill you talking about their clubs. But what better to actually teach financial literacy with something that people already enjoy? Uh, I don't know if uh, the young man uh, uh, Njabulo is here. Uh, Njabulo, are you here? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. This is a soccer fanatic that actually helped. Her. I don't. I don't follow soccer much. I just had an idea, and this young man that we got as a matriculant is now part of the people that developed the podcast, and also this. I think I'm here now saying to employers, seeing the challenges around um, uh, uh, employment for young people, please create opportunities for young people to be connected to opportunities. Uh, we developed this e-learning platform uh, that you guys can plug into if you have you know, free courses that you want to educate people. Property investing, you want to plug it in, we've got one of the uh, uh, e-learning platform that has collaboration. Basically, we want to digitize uh, because we're in the learnership space as well, grooming uh, wealth managers. We want to digitize uh, education and, um, uh, and uh, work, basically. Um, we've seen a lot of people a lot of young people sleeping outside because of um, uh, not having accommodation. Now, my, my thinking is, why don't we digitize everything so that people can be able to learn and work online? We're already working from home. I have a learner in KZN who is now homeless, has come all the way from Eastern Cape to KZN for a learnership, right? But he could be learning online and being exposed to work from home. 
The guy is homeless and it's not the only story. There's many stories like that. And we say, if you want to collaborate with us with any of the initiatives that you do, we are social entrepreneurs. We want you to plug and play if you're a corporate or whatever case, the, the case may be. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. is just amazing. I feel like uh, this was a proper masterclass. Um, I was following you in the back there. I was like, Yo, this has to be my next uh, teacher. Uh, we said Marcus, of course, she's the only teacher. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have a panel discussion now. Uh, Bato and uh, Andile, please. Uh, we have a whole lot of questions from a whole lot of people. Uh, please uh, give me a few minutes.